So in this video, we're going to talk about the two basic domains of prokaryotes. That's going to be the bacteria and the archaea. Uh, if just to remind us of very basic properties of prokaryotic cells, remember that they are much smaller. So this would be a prokaryote here, and this would be a much larger eukaryotic. Maybe this is a, an actual plant cell, uh, perhaps. Um, and the prokaryotic cells are much more basic. Remember that they just contain things like a cell membrane to control what go in and out of the cell at the border. Uh, maybe bacteria have walls along with membranes just for structural support like plants do. Um, they certainly have to have some kind of genetic code like DNA and RNA to code for proteins. And then they need little ribosomes that actually build the proteins as well. Uh, but that's basically all they have, right? Um, so they don't have a nucleus shell like this eukaryotic cell has around the DNA inside. Um, and they don't have specialized organelles like this chloroplast or maybe this giant vacuole or this endoplasmic reticulum. They don't have any of the fancy structures that specialize in doing jobs. Prokaryotes are also going to be single-celled organisms because for whatever reason you have to be uh, eukaryotic to be multicellular. So those are some basic properties of prokaryotes. Now let's just talk about the two major groups. Uh, there used to just be one. We just always referred to bacteria as the prokaryotes, but sort of later analysis we found some, some species of prokaryotes that we decided to call a separate group or the archaea. Uh, for our purposes, it's kind of a complicated conversation, but we just want to talk about how maybe genetic analysis, remember how we could compare the DNA sequences of different organisms, and apparently for certain genes, bacteria and archaea are about as different from each other genetically as they are from us eukaryotes. And so maybe finally us biologists decided that, that was convincing enough evidence to declare um, not only two different kingdoms, but two different domains. So domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya, everybody else. And um, it, one other thing I'll just briefly say about archaea is we used to think that they only lived in very extreme places. So this is a very pretty picture of a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. And it's actually species of archaea that kind of give the hot springs their color like this. Um, so there are still archaea that live in kind of weird, extreme places like this very hot, hot spring. Um, but as it turns out, sort of, we found that archaea live in, in fairly normal places too. So they can be found in extreme places, but um, not only those places like a textbook might still say. Um, so one of the things I just want to get across when kind of surveying the prokaryotes is just how diverse they are. Um, they are capable of so many different um, interesting chemical properties that, that many of the eukaryotes don't have, um, simply because they've maybe been around on this planet much longer than we eukaryotes have. Um, and so just to get a sense of that, I don't want you to memorize these terms I'm about to throw at you, but I just want you to get kind of the broader sense of just how interesting bacteria are. Um, so we might think of autotrophs, right? Uh, organisms who can sort of make their own food or in the more formal definition, make their own molecules that make up their bodies. Um, and so we might think of plants, right? Well, as it turns out, if we were to kind of be more specific, we would say that plants really are only photoautotrophs. Um, yes, they can make their own molecules, but they need to use light energy to do that, photo. Uh, as it turns out, there are also bacteria who can do photosynthesis as well, so it's not just plants. Um, but the reason why I bring up photoautotrophs is because uh, there are also interesting species of bacteria and archaea that are chemoautotrophs instead. So they can make up the molecules of their body um, from very simple chemicals, but they use chemical energy to do that, not light. So for example, uh, communities that thrive on the ocean floor, there's certainly the sunlight doesn't reach the ocean floor. So they'd have to use an alternative source of energy to power their chemosynthesis. Um, and again, there are species of bacteria in archaea who could do that. So if we were to classify ourselves, we might classify ourselves as chemoheterotrophs. Uh, we get our molecules from other organisms, heterotroph, and we also break down some of those chemicals to supply our energy. 
Um, so um, unsurprisingly, that's us animals, also fungi, and then there are certainly species of bacteria and archaea who work that way as well. And kind of a very funky group, um, they're actually photoheterotrophs. They still consume others for their molecules, but they can still also absorb sunlight for their energy, which is kind of wild. Um, but as it turns out, there are bacteria and archaea there too. So for our purposes, just how diverse a group, you know, all kinds of different species bacteria are in terms of what enzymes they might have and how they go about making a living. Uh, just one more specific example that we uh, discussed before, but we've only ever found species of bacteria who can take nitrogen out of the air and put it into the soil for plants to be able to absorb. Um, here's a neat little picture of a plant who actually has a symbiotic association with bacteria. Um, it actually lets the, uh, these little bacteria infect their roots and it feeds the bacteria and the bacteria provide it with uh, an abundant supply of nitrogen. So, you know, as I was kind of suggesting with that last slide, there are plenty of good bacteria. I don't want you thinking that all bacteria are nasty bacteria that cause disease. We'll get to them in just a minute. Um, but just to give it an example of bacteria that work with us too, there are all kinds of bacteria in your gut, um, specifically in your large intestine. Your intestines have the job of kind of pulling the nutrients out of food after you've digested them. And um, we have a lot of evidence now to suggest that the bacteria in our large intestine kind of also help us cut up the food and absorb it a little better. And so the bacteria are really important players in terms of um, helping us uh, pull nutrients out of food. Of course, there are bacteria that cause disease as well. So this is a really um, in up close picture of salmonella, um, a disease you really don't ever want to get. Um, now we do have medicines to cure that uh, potential bacterial disease. We have antibiotics, um, but as we've discussed in our evolution unit, um, antibiotic resistance is a growing problem. Um, and um, just to make it clear, antibiotics only kill bacteria. Okay, there are lots of ways that prokaryotes are different from us eukaryotes, and so usually those medicines target them specifically. Um, now, how do bacteria become resistant? Um, after all, they only uh, reproduce asexually through binary fission. Remember, binary fission is just a simple process of copying their simple cell and making two copy cells. So, um, you know, one answer is that they just reproduce faster than us. They go through many, many, many generations in our lifetime. And so maybe just through mutations, uh, they might have acquired resistance to our medicines. Um, but just two other adaptations I just want to close the video with. Uh, one of them is the scary uh, uh, ability they have called conjugation. Conjugation is where um, one bacterium might be able to kind of make a temporary bridge with a neighboring bacterium and share a little bit of DNA with it. Um, as it turns out, this DNA might be on a, a little circle called a plasmid um, rather than their whole chromosome that they're sharing. Uh, but if those genes for resisting our antibiotic medicines are on this plasmid, then that really means that one bacterium might be able to make another bacterium resistant, and that's kind of scary for us and in our medicines. Okay, a uh, final adaptation that some bacteria can do is called forming endospores. Endospores are basically like a little bomb shelter they make. So they can actually make themselves even smaller, um, really just kind of surround their DNA and that's about it and make a really tough shell when they detect that conditions are getting difficult for them to survive. Um, and they kind of become dormant um, and don't do very much, but the idea is that they can survive for years, in some cases even centuries as an endospore and when they detect that conditions are better, they can kind of wake up and become active again. And that's really scary in the case of endospores um, that cause disease because um, in your dentist's office or your doctor's office, they have to work really hard to make sure that they kill even the endospores, um, typically by putting all their, their materials and, and um, uh, uh, equipment in a sterilizer that kind of makes it really hotter than boiling water to make sure they kill the spores. 
All right, so we talked about basic um, prokaryotic characteristics. We tried to talk about two groups, um, just briefly introducing them, the archaea and the bacteria. And we just tried to get a really quick survey of just how diverse prokaryotes are.